A day after community, op community op opposition to Johns Hopkins' plans to have its own police force, a man is shot near campus. The latest on their plans and reaction from Mayor Brandon Scott. Fox 45 News has learned the identity of the man found shot to death in a burning vehicle in Baltimore. A look tonight at the city's crime crisis and our push for accountability. We're keeping an eye on the tropics as Hurricane Fiona continues its move. We're tra tracking a tropical depression that could impact our region. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 News at 10. Good evening, I'm Kai Jackson. And I'm Maxine Stryker. We're following three big stories tonight in a city in crisis. A day after the community pushed back on armed private security for Johns Hopkins University, a man is shot near the campus. Despite the mayor and police department introducing a crime plan for the summer, Baltimore's violence and crime rages on. Tonight, Fox 45 News is demanding accountability from the mayor and other city leaders on their promises to break the cycle of violence and keep residents safe. We have complete coverage of a city in crisis. Let's go to Keith Daniels and the unrelenting violence the city is facing. Keith. Well, Kai and Maxine, we've seen the crime fighting plans come from the mayor and the police department and the demands for action coming from the city council members. But tonight, it appears a solution to the murder problem is slow coming. In the deep brush along Cloman Street Wednesday, a grim discovery. An unidentified woman found dead. Her body suffered trauma. Police investigating her death as a homicide. September 13th, someone shot and killed Lawrence Green III on North Cochran Street. Before that, September 1st, the first murder of the month. Khalil Akins gunned down on Holland Street. Those killings, the latest round of violence that continues to grip Baltimore City as fall approaches after a summer of discontent. People are calling our offices crying out. This city needs some help. At the start of the summer, city council members feared an unusually violent summer and called on the mayor and police department for a plan to fight it. We are specifically asking for more resources. In June, the police department produced a summer crime plan. But by the end of the month, 39 people had lost their lives, proving to be the deadliest month in the city's history. As of this morning, a total of 253 homicides, with 538 people shot who survived. And one of those keeping close watch of the dismal numbers. Mayor Scott can't say something's working when in fact it's not. Believe the city's crime crisis is only going to get worse because of the mayor's crime plan that doesn't seem to be effective. He's telling us that don't believe your lying eyes. We have more homicides this year, year to date, than we've had in any previous year. And Mayor Scott's uh, to blame for that. Mayor Scott's plan has not worked or else we'd see fewer people dying in the streets of Baltimore. But in August, there were fewer homicides. 26 people lost their lives, which was four fewer murders seen in August last year. On the radio, the mayor vowed to stay the course. You know, I am not satisfied with where, where we are. I'm not satisfied even though for the month of August, we had less people killed in the month of August than we did last year. Still far too many for me. Well, if you have any information on those shootings we showed you, you can call Metro Crime Stoppers. You could be eligible, or rather you can remain anonymous and could be eligible for a reward up to $8,000. We're live tonight. Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Hey, thank you. And new information now about the man found dead in a burning car in Baltimore's Leakin Park. Baltimore City Police has identified him as 39-year-old Stephen Gillis. The investigation into his murder, it reaches all the way to Hanover. Anne Arundel County Police say a witness saw Gillis being stabbed, then forced into a car at gunpoint at the Arundel Preserve near Arundel Mills. So far, no word on who might have abducted him and left him for dead. A 60-year-old man is shot overnight near Johns Hopkins University, and that shooting happened on McAldery Street near Wolf Street. That shooting is in an area Hopkins wants its proposed police force to patrol. Well, yesterday, community members shut down the first of three public hearings on that force. The university says more police are needed to address rising crime around campus. Those opposed to more police say they're concerned about how that force will treat people of color. 
Alexa Ashwell is digging into the crime numbers in that area. She also has a response from Mayor Scott. One of the three proposed districts for this Johns Hopkins Police Department is right here in East Baltimore. Statistics show police have responded to more than three dozen crimes in this area surrounding the hospital's main campus here so far this year. That includes homicides and shootings. The opposition heard loud and clear. There's not been a 100% successful police force. But supporters of Johns Hopkins creating its own private police force. It's probably a reasonable effort to increase public safety. Agree the need is in the numbers. The proposed police department would cover three of the university's campuses, including Homewood, Peabody, and East Baltimore. According to BPD's online statistics, approximately 74 crimes were reported within these areas so far this year. More than half of those crimes happening within its East Baltimore campus. Here, approximately 44 crimes committed, including two homicides, 10 non-fatal shootings, 12 aggravated assaults, and 14 larcenies. BPD has expressed skepticism, saying its officers would still have to assist in investigating crimes on campuses, but residents like Bob Garnett. The Baltimore police force seems a little overwhelmed and understaffed. And law enforcement experts like Jason Johnson believe a force would only help BPD. The city is once again on pace to surpass more than 300 homicides for the eighth consecutive year. And the department remains hundreds of officers short. The mayor questioned if he would sign off on the agreement or block it. The MOU is, is, uh, is with the police department itself. Uh, that's what the, the legislation in Annapolis requires. I think that we've seen uh, these protests happen the entire time, and really it's up to Hopkins to understand what their entire community wants and make a decision on whether they want to, to move forward or not. But uh, what I will say is that when you think about universities around, around the, the city, including Coppin and Morgan, they have police forces. We know that U University of Baltimore has a police force. U UMD, uh, most colleges do have that. So no direct answer from the mayor. JHU will be hosting two more public hearings next week. In East Baltimore, Alexa Ashwell, Fox 45 News. The defensiveness you see is because they, they really don't, that, that Mayor Scott really does not believe that he can answer the questions. Well, from a health clinic with serious rodent problems to transparency questions inside City Hall, Mayor Brandon Scott has spent the week fielding questions about what he's doing. Fox 45's Mackenzie Frost has been demanding answers all week. She has the full story. After City Council President Nick Mosby said that he thought it was unacceptable that Mayor Brandon Scott didn't tell him before making the announcement these changes were coming to safe streets, the mayor now tells me that there was a mistake made, and experts say this is just the latest example of apparent dysfunction inside City Hall. City Hall wrapping up a bumpy week. Almost every week is a bad week for the mayor. An inspector general report highlighting a rodent-riddled health clinic. Photos showing what appears to be the same dead rat mummified in the same spot years later. Well, the mayor yeah. going on and defense on the radio this week saying it was a different rat. Mitigated, right? But yes. not giving a straight answer about why the clinic wasn't shut down the first time. So we followed answer up Friday. Why the Druid Sex Health Clinic wasn't shut down given the years long issues. Thank you, McKenzie, and I'll say again, uh, because we're gonna be continuing to uh, make sure that DGS does what they need to do to provide the people working there and visiting there the clinic that they need and deserve. Again, not a direct answer, but Mayor Scott says the clinic will eventually be rebuilt. Then the cloud of confusion surrounding Safe Streets, the program already shrouded in questions. Mayor Scott announcing the restructuring seven days ago, only to find out that's when the leader of the city council and chair of the city's spending board found out about it too. My team nor myself was provided any prior briefing on the restructuring of Safe Streets and this uh, the, the new approach from the mayor. Is that problematic to you? Extremely problematic. This time, Mayor Scott owning a mistake. Was it an oversight on your, from your administration's perspective not to inform 
the city council president and other people involved with public safety when you made the decision about safe streets? So we've been through this before. And as I said yesterday on WBAL, uh, uh, some, someone made a mistake and they didn't notify the council president and that's been addressed. Uh, but uh, other members who were directly impacted in their service area were directly impacted, were notified and people will be, uh, be notified and that's been corrected on my end. But still keeping some details about the shakeup no. to himself. Okay. It's been a week since we heard about the safe street stuff, the reorganization. Are we any closer on getting information on how much these new contracts will be worth? So, McKenzie, I think you know this very well. Contracts go through the Board of Estimates, and that's when they come to the public. I don't know how many times we have to tell you that. We might have to give you guys a, another lesson on how city government works. Board of Estimates is where the public sees contracts, and that's how we're transparent. Your administration works with it, though. We work drafting the, you know, Monty is the one working with these agencies. All right. We, we have a public process of showing contracts to the Board of Estimates in Baltimore, and that's how we're going to do that. We're not going to violate agreements and, and organizations' ability to work on these things before they go out to the public in the right way through the established uh, uh, public transparent process that has in, been here in Baltimore for hundreds of years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's not prepared rhetorically. He's not prepared politically. Uh, he's in over his head. Richard Vatz, rhetoric professor at Towson University, says the mayor's continued pattern of not answering questions directly underscores the problems. They don't want to. They don't want to deal with particular particular issues. They they'll contrast with failures in the past or they'll pass the buck. It's funny, but it's not funny. These communication concerns come on the city continues down the path of a crime crisis. On pace to surpass 300 homicides for the eighth year in a row, non-fatal shootings on the rise, and the mayor answers questions without clarity. The mayor says he did speak with some members of the council before making the announcement, but he won't tell me who, so those are still details I'm trying to figure out. In the meantime, there are questions about transparency, accountability, and oversight for the Safe Streets program. All things we'd like to talk to Shante Jackson about. She's the director of the agency implementing the program. Our request to do a sit-down interview so far has yet to be granted. In Baltimore, Mackenzie Frost, Fox 45 News. Well, that brings us to our question of the day now. After seeing how the mayor has handled this summer, does Mayor Scott deserve a second term? So far, 99% of those who voted say no. We would like to hear from you. Go to foxbaltimore.com slash vote to weigh in. We'll review those results at the end of the night. Our Weather Authority team is keeping an eye on the tropics right now. On your left is Hurricane Fiona, a major storm moving north. Now, Fiona isn't expected to make landfall in the U.S., but will be bringing storm surge to the east coast. In fact, Canada, as Jasmine tells us, could also feel the impact. And on your right, Tropical Depression 9 is moving westward in the eastern Caribbean. That remains somewhat disorganized at this time, but it's picking up some steam and could impact South Florida and even our region. Meteorologist Jasmine Lomax monitoring its path. It's very early, but you are keeping a close eye on this. Yeah, that's right. It's very, very early. And actually, the computer models have been struggling with the path of the system. The National Hurricane Center has actually said that there is an increased amount of uncertainty with the track of the system after it moves past Cuba and toward the Gulf of Mexico. Now, we're actually seeing National Weather Service offices across the country from the Dakotas to Maine to Texas and Florida. They'll be releasing two weather balloons to get more data on this to kind of help those models hone in on an exact forecast track. But right now, we know that it's a depression with max sustained winds of 35 miles per hour. Once it gains winds of 39 miles per hour or higher, it would become a named storm and it would become Ian. Now, we do expect that system to continue to move west. That is agreed upon by many of the models. It moves toward the Western Caribbean and then possibly becomes a Category 1 hurricane before making landfall in Cuba. After that, we're looking at impacts and rapid intensification as it moves into the Gulf, then impacts to Florida, possibly as a major hurricane. But again, there is a lot of uncertainty with this system. We'll continue to track it, and we should know more information as we head into Sunday and Monday. Back to you. All right, thank you, Jasmine. You can access the latest information when severe weather hits right on your cell phone. Download the Fox 45 weather app. Just search for WBFF in your app store to get started. The son of University of Maryland's football coach killed five years ago and his killer still not apprehended. The new charges in the case. Are the Orioles for sale? What a new report could tell us about the O's future. 
Republicans go back to an old playbook and reveal a new plan for winning in November. I'm Scott Thuman in Pennsylvania with a closer look. Fox 45 News, winner of 17 2022 Regional Emmy Awards, more than all other Baltimore news stations combined. A Montgomery County Circuit judge rules Maryland can count mail-in and absentee ballots before Election Day. Yeah, the board can begin counting mail-in ballots on October 1st ahead of Election Day. It's 40 days earlier than the law allows. The judge heard arguments from both sides on the case Tuesday. Maryland was the only state which requires absentee and mail-in ballots to be counted after Election Day. Republican gubernatorial candidate Dan Cox is against changing this process. When we see the electoral process upheld, when we see the law and the Constitution upheld, that's where we get our confidence in. And Westmore and the Board of Elections, because Westmore has stated he, he wants to start counting in opposition to the law, they're the ones not trusting the process. So do you trust the process? Will you accept the outcome of the election? With the honoring of the Constitution and the law, of course, that gives us a huge measure of support for the process. The Board of Elections anticipates they'll receive between 1 and 1.3 million mail-in ballots during the general election. Right now, 524,000 mail-in ballots they have already been requested. And promises in politics, they almost go hand in hand today. Republicans issuing plenty of them. That's right. Republicans are trying to take control of Congress as midterm elections get close. The question is, will it work? Sinclair's chief political correspondent Scott Thuman is in Pennsylvania with a look. In the strategically valuable Pennsylvania, a political team lying in wait. Republicans hoping in six weeks they can take back the House revealed their so-called commitment to America. These ideas came from the American people. All of our members listened to their constituents. The promises, if in power, among other things, to boost American energy production by cutting the permit process in half, move supply chains away from China, and catch and release loopholes for immigrants, and use recruiting bonuses for another 200,000 police officers. 300 people a day are dying from fentanyl, mm -hmm. from being poisoned. That's the equivalent of an airline being crashed every single day. And they're banking on a struggling economy to help flip those seats. 
63% of voters complain their income is falling behind the cost of living, and 58% disapprove of President Biden's handling of the economy. All Democrats are getting is record levels of spending, record inflation, record crime, no border, record energy costs. While Democrats dismiss much of this as just lip service, they do acknowledge they need more results out of Washington if they're to hold on these midterms. It's not just about building back to what it was before. We have a chance to build back in a way to make it better for everybody. Everybody. They claim the infrastructure and American rescue plans do exactly that. Just about actually delivering for the country, and we're going to continue to, uh, to run on lowering costs, uh, delivering for the American people. If it all sounds like a repeat, remember Newt Gingrich's 1994 contract with America, vowing to cut taxes and shrink government. It, too, released just six weeks before Election Day during President Clinton's first term, sparking a GOP takeover. They say this, the time and place for a comeback. In Monongahela, Pennsylvania, Scott Thuman, Fox 45 News. A new report says the Orioles' owners may be looking to sell what that means for the future of the team in Baltimore. Tens of billions of dollars of fraud in pandemic unemployment programs. I'm Atrell Nashar with why government watchdogs say that's just the tip of the iceberg. Major developments in the government's fight to uncover and prosecute pandemic fraud. The Department of Justice announced a boost in resources to investigate more of this fraud. National correspondent Atra El Nashar spoke to one of the government's top watchdogs about the work ahead of them. When the pandemic hit, it was a government response unlike any in history. The bill is passed. More than $5 trillion was spent. Now, another unprecedented response is underway to find out how much of that money was lost to fraud and to try to get it back. We know our work is not done. The Department of Justice setting up three new fraud strike force teams to bolster their effort, which has already charged more than 1,000 people. And it does reflect the fact that 
uh, there are a lot more cases to come. Inspector General Michael Horowitz leads the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. He anticipates it may take years. One of the most prominent initiatives was enhanced unemployment benefits. In total, $655 billion went out. $46 billion is estimated to have gone to fraud, a number expected to rise significantly because it's based on estimates from fewer than half the states. Pennsylvania estimates $6 billion went to fraudsters. In Michigan, $8.2 billion, and in California, $18.7 billion. Horowitz points out how the program was crafted. To get the money out quickly, Congress allowed states to let applicants self-certify their claims. You just signed a statement saying, I'm entitled to this money. A mountain of cases of unemployment fraud, but there are 450 programs across more than 40 federal agencies investigating their own fraud. One case out of Minnesota this week caught the nation's attention. 47 people charged in a quarter billion dollar scheme, allegedly stealing from a program meant to feed children in need. These 47 defendants engaged in a brazen scheme of staggering proportions. The government doesn't yet have a total of how much COVID money was fraudulently obtained, but based on reports, it could be well above $100 billion. So far, the DOJ seized about $1.2 billion. We're going to try and track down every penny we can. Though some of it may never be recovered. In Washington, I'm Atral Nishar reporting. City school students at a severe disadvantage, their classrooms falling apart. That information from a new report will have more coming up. And a Maryland coach's son killed five years ago tonight. A man has been charged with obstructing that probe. We'll have the latest in the investigation. And neighbors fed up with the noise and danger. We'll hear from community members calling for an end to dirt bikes in the city. Welcome back. It's 1030. I'm Maxine Stryker. And I'm Kai Jackson. Our top stories right now. A Maryland man is charged tonight with interfering with the death investigation of the son of the University of Maryland's head football coach. Nico Loxley was shot and killed in 2017 in Columbia. He was 25. His killer 
has still not been found. Court documents show that prosecutors have charged John Willie Kennedy Jr. from Gaithersburg for obstructing their investigation. They say he lied under oath before a federal grand jury investigating Miko's death. The documents do not provide details about his involvement, and Loxley's family, meanwhile, continues to ask for the public's help to find closure. Nothing will ever bring Miko back. Nothing will ever fill the void that we have left in our hearts. Us not being able to watch him grow to become the man, the father, the husband that we had hoped he become. We hope as a family that anyone that's listening, that who may have information, that you come forward to help bring closure to our family. Investigators say they've been looking at every possible motive, including a possible robbery and the possibility that it may have been drug related or the result of an ongoing dispute. No motive is known at this time. There's a $20,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest. New tonight, a female inmate being held at Harford County Detention Center has died. She's 44-year-old Tina Marie Billings from Whiteford. Now, the sheriff's office says she died from complications of COVID, pneumonia, and a staph infection. Billings had been in the hospital since Wednesday night. Prison officials say her condition quickly deteriorated. Now, we don't know when she first became ill. She'd been jailed since August. Her death is now under investigation. Well, the Orioles have reportedly hired Goldman Sachs to assess a potential team sale. That's according to a report from The Athletic. There's been no clear decision to sell the team. This would be the first step in the process. The Orioles owner, Peter Angelos, who is 93, has been battling health issues for years. Now his sons are battling each other in court over control of the team. Son Lewis is the acting chairman and CEO. The article states if the team were to be sold, it would likely happen after Peter's death. So the family could avoid a potential multi-million dollar tax hit. You can be the first to know about breaking news by signing up for News on the Go. Just go to foxbaltimore.com and click on Mobile Alert Sign Up. That's underneath the station tab. We're following two big stories tonight in a city in crisis. More than a month after Baltimore City Council passes a bill on street racing, that bill is still on the desk of Mayor Scott, and we're questioning when it will become law. And a new report from Johns Hopkins shows dozens of Baltimore City school buildings are falling apart, and students are the ones suffering. We have team coverage tonight. Keith Daniels has the latest on the bill cracking down on street racing. First, Rebecca Pryor has more on a new report on some Baltimore school buildings in shambles. Yeah, according to this study, Baltimore City school buildings, they're falling apart and the students are suffering because of it. A new Johns Hopkins study showing Baltimore City school buildings failing in almost every category. This is a school system in desperate need with the worst conditions. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein is one of the study's authors. He says the team analyzed data from a state investigation comparing city schools to the county. The disparities were drastic. We shouldn't put our kids through that and there shouldn't be this huge difference just driving across a county line in whether the schools are schools that you can be proud of or schools that you're embarrassed by. They estimate about 50 city school buildings are practically crumbling, leading to by far and away the most health hazards of any other district. Everything from broken AC units to leaking ceilings, adding up to around $141 million in needed repairs. And at the end of the day, it's our children paying the price. It affects their self-esteem and affects their ability to go to school because the school's not open, because it's, there's something broken, and it affects their health in, in many ways. So this is a pretty serious issue. A lack of functioning heating and cooling systems alone costing kids 1.2 million hours of lost school time over a five-year span. The study also including direct quotes from students, one writing, not having air conditioning, you can't focus when it's 80 degrees. It was terrible going to school. The city's 21st Century Buildings program is offering some relief. However, it's just not enough. And so what's really necessary is for the state to step up and the state to say this kind of gap, this treatment of Baltimore City school kids is unacceptable. When asked to comment, city schools blaming the poor conditions on, quote, decades long underfunded to hear that they don't have enough money for infrastructure doesn't make sense to anybody but taxpayer advocate david williams says more money from the state isn't the answer this is about the funds going to the wrong purposes the school's current 1.6 billion dollar budget comes out to more than twenty one thousand dollars being spent per student 
So despite significant disparities in the city's capital projects funding, they remain one of the highest funded school systems in America. They need to find a way to shift part of the $1.2 billion uh, to capital projects so taxpayers aren't on the hook for more money. And not only are Baltimore City schools some of the highest funded in the nation, they remain some of the lowest performing. Reporting in Baltimore, Rebecca Pryor, Fox 45 News. A month ago, Baltimore City Council passed a bill that seeks to crack down on street racing. That bill is now on the desk of Mayor Brandon Scott waiting for his signature. Keith Daniels asked the mayor today when he plans to sign that bill and if it will bring any changes. Well, the city council says it's all about doing what they can to make city streets safer, cracking down on illegal off-road vehicles. But tonight, waiting for a response from the mayor. In Baltimore, you know the sound. The roar of illegal dirt bikes and the squealing of illegal stunt driving, the spinning of vehicles that block busy intersections. More and more, the images caught on camera by frustrated residents. People just feel unsafe on the road. Including Aaron Williams, who captured this. Several off-road vehicles, ATVs, dirt bikes, barreling down Security Boulevard Saturday, heading toward the city. The bottom line is that this matter needs to be addressed and these people need to be held accountable for the laws that they're breaking. But riders we spoke to say they don't believe they're doing anything wrong. I just drive my dirt bike for fun, for real. But they're illegal. I mean, I do it for fun. It ain't illegal to me. The Baltimore City Council recently approved legislation that prohibits the obstruction of streets, racing, and stunt driving. It also applies to illegal racing and stunt driving on dirt bikes. Councilman Isaac Yitzi Schleifer introduced the bill this summer. Until now, uh, it's been hard to enforce because the, the laws that would apply to this uh, behavior is really nominal, and so therefore it's never really been enforced. Uh, and it wasn't also clear about what specific behaviors can and cannot be done. The bill has been sent to Mayor Brandon Scott. Scheifler said he expects the mayor's signature by the end of the month. We reached out to the mayor's office asking, what's the status of the proposed ordinance? And when do you expect the mayor to sign the bill? The mayor's office acknowledged receipt of our inquiry. Beyond that, we have not heard back. Well, if approved, the new law would allow police to fine violators up to $1,000 in addition to 12 months in jail as a misdemeanor charge. Reporting tonight, Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Yeah, they're clapping because the pain is over. Stocks tumbled today, capping off another rough week on Wall Street. The Dow finishes the day down 486 points, not the worst. The S&P dropped 64, and the Nasdaq Composite slid about 198. All this after Russia announced plans to insert more troops into Ukraine. The Fed hiked interest rates again to historical highs, indicating others were coming too. Trending right now, you're looking live at the White House, where Elton John... The Great performed tonight as part of his farewell tour. How wonderful life is. Mm. John, I know, it's just, I get chills listening to this cat. John called the concert a night when hope and history rhyme. It's a reference to a poem by the late Irish poet Seamus Haney. Now, that President Biden often, often quotes, obviously. It's John's first White House gig since performing at a state dinner in 1998 when Stevie Wonder uh, was there to honor British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Tonight, Biden praised Elton John for being a champion for LGBTQ rights and for his music that has, quote, set us free. It's clear Elton John's music has changed our lives. To David and the boys, thank you for sharing your husband and dad with us tonight. On behalf of the American people, Thank you, and I sincerely mean this. Thank you for moving the soul of our nation. Oh, man. Elton John, now 75. I can't believe he's 75. Is on his farewell tour after performing for more than 50 years. And I said to Maxine tonight, this man's catalog is insane. Yeah. I was just thinking, what is my favorite song of his? Oh, and I can't. It's hard. I, can't. Uh, I, I listened to him growing up 
with my late dad, Philadelphia Freedom, I would say, and sorry seems to be the hardest word, are two of my favorite songs by him. I mean, but Yellow Brick Road, I mean, the list goes on, right? So many. So many hits. So How many. wonderful. Oh, there. Oh, That's beautiful. one of my favorites. That's a beautiful song. Can we listen to more? Come on. That's beautiful. <laughs> oh, come on. It's Elton John. It's it Sir is. Elton John. <laughs> Well, tomorrow marks week four of college football. Big noon kickoff is on Fox 45 this Saturday. Coverage starts at 10 a.m. Maryland takes on Michigan at noon, followed by the Fox College Football Extra at 3.30. Oregon will take on Washington State at 4, and Kansas State is at Oklahoma at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. And also on Saturday, the CW will be airing HBCU games throughout the season, courtesy of the Black College Sports Broadcasting Network. This week, Virginia Union will be taking on Fayetteville State. Kickoff is at 3 o'clock. Sunday, the Ravens will take on the New England Patriots at Gillette Stadium. You can watch the game right here on Fox 25 kickoff. It's at 1 o'clock. Jasmine? We are keeping track of our next weather maker. It's been nice and dry over the past couple days, but that cold front will bring our next chance for rain. I'll break down the timing of the rain and what we're seeing in the tropics coming up in my full forecast. More kids than ever struggle with mental health issues. A mother's warning about the drastic steps she had to take to save her child. First full day of fall, and you know who is excited for the season's change. Our morning meteorologist, Justin Chambers. Justin, not missing a chance this morning to grab a cup of pumpkin spice latte. And we know he's not the only one. I got one today, too. Wouldn't be surprised if Jasmine did as well. And we're tracking our fall colors, too. Western Maryland is leading our state with the trees changing. According to the DNR, the sugar maples in the lower elevations of the Walman area of Potomac State Forest, they're already displaying vibrant yellow leaves. We want you to help us document the season's change. You can send us a picture of fall colors when you come across them to foxbaltimore.com slash chime in. 
All right, Jasmine is here now. Fall is definitely here. I just remembered you like the the apple yes. drink at yes. Starbucks, not the it's pumpkin. It's so good. Yeah, no, I'm very anti pumpkin spice latte, right. <laughs> but the apple crisp macchiato is amazing. I highly recommend it. And tomorrow will be a great mm -hmm. day to have that. Maybe a warm one. I like the ice drinks, but tomorrow should be a great day for a warm pumpkin spice latte or apple crisp macchiatos. We'll have cool temperatures below average numbers. Right now, though, we're at 58 and already starting to see those temperatures fall. We have clear skies and winds out of the northwest around seven miles per hour. So those winds are starting to calm down across the state. Temperatures are mainly in the 50s, even cooler as we look toward western Maryland. But we're all quiet and we're all clear thanks to this high pressure system that's dominating our weather pattern. But we can already see our next weather maker. There is a warm front ahead of that a few showers, but it's the cold front that we're watching that will bring our next chance for rain as we finish out the weekend. And toward the corner of the screen, you can also see Fiona, which is expected to be a significant storm for parts of Canada. Overnight, we stay mostly dry, but there could be a couple of showers in parts of Virginia. Then as we head to about 7, 8, 9 a.m., we're starting the morning with dry weather and cool temperatures. You may want to dress appropriately for the weather tomorrow morning as it will be chilly. Then by the afternoon, those temperatures will reach the 60s, the 70s. It'll feel pretty nice with plenty of sunshine. We'll have a few showers as we head into early Sunday morning. And again, that's all ahead of that next weather maker. We will have more rain as we head into the afternoon ahead of that cold front. Meanwhile, we're keeping watch on Fiona. That system is expected to have significant impacts for Canada, being a once in a lifetime storm there. So we're continuing to monitor that, but it will weaken over the next few days as it continues to move past Canada. We're also keeping watch. We now have Tropical Storm Ian, so this just came in from the National Hurricane Center. We expect that system to remain south of Jamaica, possibly strengthening into a Category 1 hurricane before reaching Cuba. Then after that, there is still a lot of uncertainty as it enters the Gulf of Mexico, but it could undergo rapid intensification before approaching South Florida. So that's what we're watching over the next several days, and we'll continue to give you those updates. 48 for the low temperature tonight, then heading into the day tomorrow, 74 for the high. That is below average for this time of year, but we're getting back to that warm pattern as we head into Sunday. 78 with the chance for showers and a few storms ahead of that cold front. We dry out 78 on Monday. After that, we keep the fall field. Temperatures stay in the low 70s as we finish the week. Back to you. Well, with kids now back in school, we're taking a look at an invisible and ongoing threat to their health and safety. A new study found that one in five adolescents suffer from depression. And as our children are facing a mental health crisis, new data suggests the country is lagging behind when it comes to meeting young people's urgent needs. National investigative reporter Chris Daniels explains in tonight's Spotlight on America report. Seattle mom Stephanie Simpson will never forget the extreme measures she had to take to keep her child safe. And so this is actually where we stored our kitchen knives. My son, his OCD was based in self-harm and fear that he would hurt himself. Her son Xander was just a young boy when she noticed changes in his behavior. When did you first start seeing a, a crisis with your son? When he was in third grade, he was nine. That's when Xander developed debilitating headaches and suicidal thoughts. Stephanie rushed him to the ER. An exact diagnosis of OCD would take months. Then came the waiting for the right treatment. The wait list was six months. Both my husband and I felt if we waited that long, we would have lost our child's life. Access to care is a struggle millions of families face as mental health issues in children surge at unprecedented rates. What are you seeing here in your clinic? We haven't had the ability to take new clients in quite some time because there's so much demand. Dr. Kira Mouseth practices at a behavioral health clinic in Everett, Washington, and is a psychology professor at Seattle University. We don't have the capacity to help right now. Why is that? There are not enough licensed providers to deal with youth and children in terms of mental health. Mental health advocates say the scale of the need is staggering. The nonprofit Mental Health America found that more than 15% of kids nationwide reported suffering one major depressive episode in the last year. An alarming statistic that gets worse when you consider that more than 60% of them are not receiving any mental health treatment. 
Spotlight on America dug into the state-by-state -state numbers and found in Texas, 73% of kids with major depression do not have access to treatment. That's 255,000 children. In South Carolina, 67% of its kids are receiving no care. And in Virginia, it's more than half. The state with the best numbers, Maine. But even there, 30% of the kids battling major depression are not getting the help they need. What's at stake if those numbers continue or continue to go up? Well, um, on the most extreme end of things, it could be a significant increase in suicide risk. It could include things like substance use, addiction development, violent or aggressive behavior in some cases. So it's a spectrum of potential problematic outcomes, but there are some pretty significant consequences at the extreme end. Consequences that Stephanie Simpson knows well. After months of hard work and research, she was able to find the right program for her son's condition. He's now 13. How's he doing now? He's doing really well. You mentioned it downstairs. Now that he has stabilized, she's turned her attention to other kids to make sure they get the same access to treatment her son did. She's lobbying in her home state of Washington and at the federal level. Had he not gotten these services, we would have lost our child to suicide. To ensure the government covers behavioral and mental health needs for families like hers. So no child has to struggle to find and afford help when they need it the most. If I can help one other kiddo get access to help because their parent goes, oh my goodness, I can see my child in that story, then it's worthwhile. I'm Chris Daniels for Spotlight on America. For the first time ever, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is recommending regular screenings for anxiety. They say all adults under 65 should be tested by their primary doctors. That review began before the pandemic, but with a surge in mental health problems linked to isolation and stress, the task force says the guidance is very timely. That proposal is open for public comment for the next month. Now, if you or anyone you know is battling a mental health illness, there is always help right at the touch of your fingertips. Just go to foxbaltimore.com. A public nuisance that neighbors say has to be taken care of, pressing leaders on if Baltimore police will crack down on illegal dirt bikes. And the city council, the mayor, and other leaders all pushing plans, but nothing seems to be working. Digging into why it's taking so long to curb crime in Baltimore. And he's been practicing with the team, but Ronnie Stanley has not yet played a game in 2022. An update on the left tackle status ahead of Sunday's showdown in Foxborough. That's coming up next.
The last two nights, Orioles starting pitchers have been phenomenal. Jordan Lyles with a complete game, then Kyle Bradish goes eight and two thirds. Could Dean Kramer continue that trend? Birds looking to give Houston some problems. Dean Kramer was phenomenal. First career complete game shutout. When you're on, you're on. And he absolutely was. So was this guy, Adley Rutschman, providing the run support. His 12th homer of the year gives the O's a 1-0 lead. Later, we'll touch on a milestone for Rutschman. O's win it, 6-0 the final score. When Ronnie Stanley got taken off the PUP list, it was a step in the right direction. Then came his first practice. The hope is that the Ravens get their all-pro left tackle out there on the field sooner than later. But when he'll make his 2022 debut remains to be seen. Stanley was limited on Wednesday and Thursday, practicing back-to-back -back days, but did not practice at all today. He's listed as doubtful for Sunday's game against the Pats. Yeah, I really think it's kind of getting to the point where it's just kind of week-to-week, day-to-day-ish. You know, and again, it comes back to him feeling like he's going to be playing at his best. That's really what it boils down to. Very sound, very strong. I think he's in great shape. Maybe the best shape I've seen him, you know, in, in some ways since he's been here. I, I, I don't know. It's hard to compare, but... He, he, he's doing really well that way. So um, when he feels like he's ready to go out there and be Ronnie Stanley at his best, then he'll be out there. Coming up tonight, how the O's stack up in the wild card race with less than two weeks to play. Plus, Johns Hopkins puts his undefeated season on the line ahead on Sports Unlimited. A new rule will change the way Maryland handles its elections, the impact it could have on when votes are counted. They're noisy, dangerous, and creating a big problem for city residents. Pressing City Hall on if the mayor will sign a bill to crack down on illegal dirt bikes. The following segment is sponsored by Mile One Auto Group. 
Well, Baltimore families are getting some much needed help to ensure kids are safe on the road. We were in North Baltimore today as Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital and Mile One Auto Group gave away free car seats to families in need. It's a part of Child Safety Passenger Week. Technicians not only gave away the seats, but they also helped the families install them. You would be surprised how many people don't know if they have the right seat or if they've been in an accident, they need to get their seat um, reevaluated or if it's expired. So they're checking to make sure this, their seats are safe. Well, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that properly installed car seats reduce deadly injury to infants and crashes by more than 70%. Baltimore's crime problem isn't getting better and city leaders have been slow to provide solutions. We dig deeper into how the city could keep residents safe. And a judge's decision changing the way the state handles elections. The possible impact of a new rule for mail-in ballots. Neighbors fed up with the noise and the danger. The call for an end to illegal dirt bikes. Live from WBFF in Baltimore. This is Fox 45 News Late Edition. In a city in crisis, despite multiple plans from city leaders, crime in Baltimore doesn't appear to be getting better. Fox 45's Keith Daniels looks into possible solutions to the violence and why it's taking so long. Well, we've seen the crime fighting plans come from the mayor and the police department and the demands for action coming from the city council. But tonight, it appears a solution to the murder problem is slow coming. In the deep brush along Cloman Street Wednesday, a grim discovery. An unidentified woman found dead. Her body suffered trauma. Police investigating her death as a homicide. September 13th, someone shot and killed Lawrence Green III on North Cochland Street. Before that, September 1st, the first murder of the month. Khalil Akins gunned down on Holland Street. Those killings, the latest round of violence that continues to grip Baltimore City as fall approaches after a summer of discontent. People are calling our offices crying out. This city needs some help. At the start of the summer, city council members feared an unusually violent summer and called on the mayor and police department for a plan to fight it. We are specifically asking for more resources. In June, the police department produced a summer crime plan. But by the end of the month, 39 people had lost their lives, proving to be the deadliest month in the city's history. As of this morning, a total of 253 homicides, with 538 people shot who survived. And one of those keeping close watch of the dismal numbers. Mayor Scott can't say something's working when in fact it's not. Believe the city's crime crisis is only going to get worse because of the mayor's crime plan that doesn't seem to be effective. He's telling us that don't believe your lying eyes. We have more homicides this year, year to date, than we've had in any previous year. And Mayor Scott's uh, to blame for that. Mayor Scott's plan has not worked or else we'd see fewer people dying in the streets of Baltimore. But in August, there were fewer homicides. 26 people lost their lives, which was four fewer murders seen in August last year. On the radio, the mayor vowed to stay the course. You know, I am not satisfied with where, where we are. I'm not satisfied even though for the month of August, we had less people killed in the month of August than we did last year. Still far too many for me. Well, if you have any information on those deadly shootings, you can call Metro Crime Stoppers. You can remain anonymous and could be eligible for a reward up to $8,000. Reporting tonight, Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Two Parkville men arrested this week and charged with rape and sexual assault abuse of a young person. Christopher Prunty and Francis Conda are facing multiple sex abuse charges. Records indicate that Prunty was listed in the Maryland Sex Offenders Database. Online records list Conda as a public safety dispatcher for the Baltimore County government. Both are being held without bail. There's controversy surrounding the proposed Johns Hopkins Police Department and it's heating up after protesters stormed last night's public hearing. Supporters believe adding private police would increase safety in and around the campus area, especially with an understaffed Baltimore City Police Department. Alexa Ashwell looks into the impact more police could have. 
One of the three proposed districts for this Johns Hopkins Police Department is right here in East Baltimore. Statistics show police have responded to more than three dozen crimes in this area surrounding the hospital's main campus here so far this year. That includes homicides and shootings. The opposition heard loud and clear. There's not been a 100% successful police force. But supporters of Johns Hopkins creating its own private police force. It's probably a reasonable effort to increase public safety. Agree the need is in the numbers. The proposed police department would cover three of the university's campuses, including Homewood, Peabody and East Baltimore. According to BPD's online statistics, approximately 74 crimes were reported within these areas so far this year. More than half of those crimes happening within its East Baltimore campus. Here, approximately 44 crimes committed, including two homicides, 10 non-fatal shootings, 12 aggravated assaults, and 14 larcenies. BPD has expressed skepticism, saying its officers would still have to assist in investigating crimes on campuses, but residents like Bob Garnett. The Baltimore police force seems a little overwhelmed and understaffed. And law enforcement experts like Jason Johnson believe a force would only help BPD. The city is once again on pace to surpass more than 300 homicides for the eighth consecutive year. And the department remains hundreds of officers short. The mayor questioned if he would sign off on the agreement or block it. The MOU is, is, uh, is with the police department itself. Uh, that's what the legislation in Annapolis requires. I think that we've seen uh, these protests happen the entire time, and really it's up to Hopkins to understand what their entire community wants and make a decision on whether they want to, to move forward or not. But uh, what I will say is that when you think about universities around, around the, the city, including Coppin and Morgan, they have police forces. We know that U University of Baltimore has a police force. U UND, uh, most colleges do have that. So no direct answer from the mayor. JHU will be hosting two more public hearings next week. In East Baltimore, Alexa Ashwell, Fox 45 News. There was a shooting this morning within the proposed jurisdiction for a JHU police force at the hospital campus in East Baltimore. Just after 2.30, officers responded to McEldery Street near Wolf Street to investigate a shot spotter alert. That's next to Johns Hopkins Medical Campus. Moments later, a 60-year-old man walked into the hospital with a gunshot wound to the right ankle. He is expected to survive. A judge grants the Maryland State Board of Elections request to begin recounting or counting mail-in absentee ballots before Election Day. Now, barring an appeal, that board will be allowed to start counting those ballots October 1st. That's 40 days earlier than they would have been able to count ballots without the decision. The agency warned that under current policy, with the expected vote total, counting wouldn't be completed until December. In response to that decision, Governor Larry Hogan tweeted a statement saying he supports the early ballot counting and encourages Marylanders to take part in the electoral process. While the governor is now voicing support for early ballot counting, he previously vetoed a bill that would have allowed it. Now, a Fox 45 News alert in three, two, one. Well, a judge has ruled Arizona can enforce a near total ban on abortion. It's the latest in a series of states that have had bans go into effect since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Clinics across the state will have to stop providing the procedures immediately to avoid criminal charges against doctors and medical workers. That law dates back to 1901, but has not been enforced because of Roe v. Wade. An appeal is now likely. President Joe Biden today continued to push for voters to vote blue in this year's midterms, promising on Twitter that if Democrats get two more senators and keep the House, he will codify Roe v. Wade, making abortion legal across the country. Now, bans on abortion at any point in pregnancy are now in place in 12 Republican-led states. The stocks tumbled today, capping off another rough week on Wall Street. The Dow finishes down 486 points. The S&P dropped 64, and the Nasdaq composite slid 198. All this after Russia announces plans to insert more troops into Ukraine. 
The Fed hiked interest rates again to historical highs, indicating others were coming too. A bill to crack down on street racing is on the desk of the mayor. Will he sign it? We press city leaders on what's being done to stop it. And they stole money during the pandemic. Now they could be punished. What's being done to catch people who committed COVID fraud? Here's a look at today's top trending stories. Number one, a bill to crack down on street racing and illegal dirt bikes in Baltimore is on Mayor Brandon Scott's desk waiting for his signature. Illegal dirt bikes continue to be a problem in the city, creating noise and issues and sometimes dangerous conditions on city streets. Many neighborhoods are frustrated, saying they want change. The bottom line is that this matter needs to be addressed and these people need to be held accountable for the laws that they're breaking. Well, we asked the mayor's office when and if Mayor Scott plans on uh, passing a bill in the city council. I hope the city council pass a bill that would allow pe people, uh, police to punish the violators with fines of up to $1,000 in addition to 12 months in jail. We have not heard back so far. Number two, the Orioles have reportedly hired Goldman Sachs to assess a potential team sale. That, according to a report from The Athletic. Right now, there's been no clear decision to sell the team. The Orioles owner, Peter Angelos, is 93 years old and has been battling health issues for years. And now his sons are battling each other in court over control of the team. The article states if the team were to be sold, it would likely happen after Mr. Angelos's death so the family could avoid a potential multi-million dollar tax hit. Number three, this weekend, the Ravens are looking to bounce back from that heartbreaking loss to the Miami Dolphins at home. Don't miss the team taking on the New England Patriots this Sunday in Foxborough, Massachusetts. You can watch that game right here on Fox 45 at 1 o'clock. Millions of tax dollars wrongfully taken from pandemic relief programs. The new efforts to crack down on COVID fraud. And we're looking at another gorgeous day tomorrow with temperatures below average in the mid 70s. Then we heat up to the upper 70s on Sunday with the next chance for showers. After that, it's back to dry weather. I'll let you know how long our nice fall temperatures last coming up in my weather authority forecast.
According to a recent study, Baltimore City schools are falling apart, and that's hurting students. The Johns Hopkins study says about 50 city school buildings are crumbling, leading to city students facing more health hazards than students in nearby counties and jurisdictions. Some of those hazards include broken AC units and leaking ceilings. The study's authors say the damage to the classrooms is hurting kids. It affects their self-esteem and affects their ability to go to school because the school's not open, because it's, there's something broken, and it affects their health in, in many ways. So this is a pretty serious issue. City schools are dealing with these issues despite the school system being one of the most well-funded in the country. Fox 45 News is your back-to-school headquarters, and we're committed to investigating any problems your kids run into. Call our news tip line at 410-467-5595. You can also send us an email at news at foxbaltimore.com or chime in with your pictures and videos on the Fox 45 News app. It's been a gorgeous day and a great start to the weekend. We've got fall temperatures, highs reach the upper 60s and low 70s. But now it's starting to get a little chilly. Currently, we sit at 56 over Baltimore with clear skies and winds out of the west northwest. Light breeze right now across the state. We're seeing those numbers mainly in the 50s, a little bit warmer toward Annapolis, still in the 60s with clear skies. But overnight, things will get much cooler. We have high pressure over the region. That's keeping us nice and dry. To the west of that, a few showers all ahead of that warm front. That will sweep over our region, but we're watching that cold front behind it. That will be our next weather maker, leading to the chance for a few showers and storms. Meanwhile, Fiona is now post-tropical, but it is leading to impacts across Canada. Overnight, we'll have a few clouds move in, but otherwise, we stay dry. There is the chance for a little bit of rain in northern Virginia. Then as we head to about 7, 8, 9 o'clock, we're still looking at a few clouds before they dissipate. Then we'll have plenty of sunshine heading into the afternoon. Again, temperatures reach the 60s and the mid 70s. Overnight into Sunday morning, we'll have clouds and possibly a couple of stray showers. Then as we head into the afternoon, we'll have a better chance for rain ahead of that cold front. So if you have any plans to be outside, you will want to make sure that you're keeping watch on the radar. We're also keeping track of Fiona. Again, post-tropical at this point, but it is getting close to making landfall in Canada. This is expected to be a significant once-in-a-lifetime storm for that area. So we are continuing to monitor it, but as it moves north, it will weaken, still leading to heavy rain and gusty winds across Canada. Meanwhile, we're also watching Tropical Storm Ian with max sustained winds of 40 miles per hour. It's expected to move south of Jamaica as early as Sunday morning. Then after that, it approaches Cuba, possibly strengthening into a hurricane before making landfall. As it enters the Gulf, there is more uncertainty. However, it could strengthen into a major hurricane before making landfall, likely along the Florida Peninsula. Now, this cone of uncertainty is still very wide, so we'll keep monitoring the system. Here, though, we stay nice and quiet. 48 for the low temperature tonight with mostly clear skies. Then heading into the day tomorrow, 74 for the high. That is below average. We get a little closer to average on Sunday, but we have the next chance for showers, 78. Same temperature on Monday, but we stay nice and dry with lots of sunshine. After that, we stay mostly dry and temperatures sit in the low 70s. Back to you. Tens of billions of dollars of fraud in pandemic unemployment programs. I'm Atrel Nashar with why government watchdogs say that's just the tip of the iceberg.
The DOJ is providing more resources to investigate COVID fraud. National correspondent Atra El Nishar spoke to one of the government's top watchdogs about their investigations. When the pandemic hit, it was a government response unlike any in history. The bill is passed. More than $5 trillion was spent. Now, another unprecedented response is underway to find out how much of that money was lost to fraud and to try to get it back. We know our work is not done. The Department of Justice setting up three new fraud strike force teams to bolster their effort, which has already charged more than 1,000 people. And it does reflect the fact that uh, there are a lot more cases to come. Inspector General Michael Horowitz leads the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. He anticipates it may take years. One of the most prominent initiatives was enhanced unemployment benefits. In total, $655 billion went out. $46 billion is estimated to have gone to fraud, a number expected to rise significantly because it's based on estimates from fewer than half the states. Pennsylvania estimates $6 billion went to fraudsters. In Michigan, $8.2 billion, and in California, $18.7 billion. Horowitz points out how the program was crafted. To get the money out quickly, Congress allowed states to let applicants self-certify their claims. You just signed a statement saying, I'm entitled to this money. A mountain of cases of unemployment fraud, but there are 450 programs across more than 40 federal agencies investigating their own fraud. One case out of Minnesota this week caught the nation's attention. 47 people charged in a quarter billion dollar scheme, allegedly stealing from a program meant to feed children in need. These 47 defendants engaged in a brazen scheme of staggering proportions. The government doesn't yet have a total of how much COVID money was fraudulently obtained, but based on reports, it could be well above $100 billion. So far, the DOJ seized about $1.2 billion. We're going to try and track down every penny we can. Though some of it may never be recovered. In Washington, I'm Atral Nishar reporting. After back-to-back to back stellar nights for the starting pitchers, the Orioles' magic continued Friday night at Camden Yards, where the team stands after another big win. This Fox 45 News segment is sponsored by BCSPN, the Black College Sports Broadcasting Network. A legendary tennis career comes to an end. One of the greatest players of all times 
Roger Federer is retiring. He and longtime rival Rafael Nadal teamed up for a doubles match for his final time on the court. Really an appropriate way for him to go out with his rival. Federer recently announced the match would be his last due to mounting injuries. Now, he finishes his career, listen to this, with the third most Grand Slam titles in men's tennis history. He also holds a record for most consecutive weeks as the number one player in the world at 237. What a career. That's all for us on the late edition. I'm Kai Jackson. Here's Rocco DeSangro with Sports Unlimited. Rocco. Yeah, Kai, solid outings from your starting pitchers this time of year. That's exactly what a team vying for a playoff spot needs. Dean Kramer looking to continue that trend for the O's. Birds looking to give Houston some problems. Dean the machine was mowing them down. Career night for him just getting started with a strikeout here. Adley Rutschman providing the run support with a solo shot to center. His 12th of the year gives the O's a 1-0 lead. Let's go to the 7th. Birds up 4-0. Rutschman delivers again. Not only does he drive in Cedric Mullins, that's his 32nd double of the year, and he ties Cal Ripken Jr. for the most by an O's rookie in a season. First career complete game shutout for Kramer as the O's beat the Strohs. 6-0 the final. So 12 games remain for the O's, and they're currently three games back of that final wildcard spot. The Rays, Jays, and Mariners are 1-2-3. and three. The Birds have two more with the Strohs, four at Boston, three on the road against the Yanks, and then three with the Blue Jays. After suffering a concussion Sunday against the Dolphins, Devin Duvernay was a full participant in Friday's practice. Duvernay, who took the opening kick in that game, 103 yards for a touchdown, has been cleared for the Week 3 matchup against New England. So that's great news for the Ravens. You can catch all of the action from Foxborough this Sunday at 1 p.m. on Fox 45. Later that night, we'll have a full recap, highlights, and postgame reaction from the Ravens' Week 3 matchup with the Patriots at 10.35 on Sports Unlimited. How about high school football action? Polly taking on Forest Park. Engineers on the doorstep. Devin Weems takes it himself for the score, and Polly takes the lead. This time, Weems going to go to the air, but he's picked off and Forest Park would take over on O. This one, though, a defensive battle and one that Polly would win. Engineers get the dub, 8-2 to two the final score. Archbishop Spalding and Calvert Hall battling it out at the home of the Cardinals in a ranked matchup. Cavaliers up 21-7. Malik Washington with a jump pass right into the hands of P.J. Pokness for the score. Extra point attempt is blocked by Ricardo Cooper in there like a heat-seeping missile. Cardinals O, unable to get much going tonight, though. Cavaliers get the win, 42-7, the final score. How about some college football on a Friday night? Johns Hopkins coming off a 70-0 win, looking to stay hot against Moravian. Spencer Ugla had himself a night, punches it in from 11 yards out here to get the scoring started. Finds pay dirt again from three yards out. Ugla had three tubs in the first quarter alone. Nice little hat trick there, and Hopkins moves to 4-0 and with the 54 to nothing win. There's a ton of great games taking place on Saturday. Maryland opens Big Ten play against Michigan at noon. Then at 3, Fayetteville State faces Virginia Union on CW Baltimore. Stan Luter, he's calling the action, and he tells you why you should tune in. Fayetteville State won the basketball championship uh, up in Baltimore last year, so there's a lot of great things going on there. They're a very athletic team. They play really good defense, and you in Baltimore, you know you guys can relate to good defense. And Virginia Union's one of the oldest programs in, in, in college football, Division II football. And when they play V-State every year, that's like one of those second or third longest rivalries. But for this team, you've got uh, a great running back that's worth keeping your eye on. And if the Ravens draft him in a few years, you heard it here first. Jada Byers is his name. The CW will be airing HBCU games throughout the season, courtesy of the Black College Sports Broadcasting Network. You can catch that one tomorrow at 3 p.m. That's it for this edition of Sports Unlimited. I'm Rocco DeSangro. Thanks for watching, and have a great night. You got it. You got it. You too.